Funky Kong is one of the greatest characters in all of gaming. There's a difference between being a cool character and being a cool character, if you catch my drift. And my man Funky Kong is a fan favorite in Donkey Kong games, Mario spinoffs, and apparently Saturday Night Live. I was in my trailer drumming on booty cheeks like the bongos in the minigame. <laughs> I think it goes without saying that a lot of people are naturally drawn to Funky Kong, but you know, one thing I don't see people talk about very much is that he actually doesn't like adventures. He might seem like this really strong and capable guy, but he's also got some Bilbo energy in him. He doesn't like seeking out trouble if it can be avoided, and don't let Funky Kong mode fool you. Historically speaking, Funky would much rather stay in his garage and work on mechanical projects than go out and save the world. I was actually pretty surprised to learn about this aspect of Funky Kong's character one afternoon as I read through the Donkey Kong Country 2 manual. It's a normal thing people do, okay? Sometimes you have to sit back with a glass of fine wine and read about Donkey Kong lore because this shit is bananas. But as soon as I learned this new information about Funky Kong, not that he dislikes adventures, but that he hates them, I realized it was only the tip of the iceberg and lying underneath the water's surface was a wealth of detail about Funky Kong's true character development, which goes hard for absolutely no reason. There's so much more more to this cool Kong than what meets the eye. There's so much more development in this minor character than some mainline protagonists receive in their own series. I mean, this is the same guy as this. Is he a mechanic or is he a weapons producer? Does he want to give Candy surfing lessons or does he want her to ride his wave? Is he just some west coast beach bum who's a few bad days away from starting a podcast, blowing up, and acting like he don't know nobody? <laughs> Well, I decided to peel back the layers of Funky Kong to see what's really underneath that banana. I mean that bandana. Because if Funky Kong hates adventures so much, I wanted to know what does truly drive him. I wanted to know if Funky Kong mode in Tropical Freeze is an example of actual character development, or if it's just Nintendo burning all the amazing lore and world building that Rare handed to them on a silver platter. Because that's another thing people don't talk about enough. Praise Marvel all you want, but it was none other than Rare who practically had its own cinematic universe in the 90s and early 2000s. And instead of Iron Man, Spider boy and Jeremy Renner, it had unforgettable characters like Whizpig, the Brothers Bear, Redneck Kong, and Banana Birds. I don't know what that is, I've never seen that. So that's what we're gonna do today, talk about Funky Kong and how interesting his character development is. And one thing I've gotta say before getting into the analysis is that this video would not have been possible without the help of Heil from DK Vine. His insight into both the lore of the Donkey Kong universe and his insight into Funky Kong himself was instrumental in making this this video. Okay, with that said, let's get started. If we want to know how we went from this to this, we gotta go back to the beginning. We gotta leave the city and go into the country, by which I mean... Donkey Kong Country released in 1994 and was the first ever appearance of Funky Kong. Steve Mayles, the designer of Funky Kong, says he just added teeth, some shades, and a bandana to the Donkey Kong model, and with these simple characteristics, Funky Kong was born. And even though Funky Kong's original appearance and role are among his simplest in the series, there's actually a lot we can learn about his character if we look at this game, its Game Boy Advance remake, and some additional materials published at the time. In this game, Funky Kong really Really is just a cool guy with a bit of an entrepreneurial streak. I'd say it's fair to classify him as a himbo. His main role is that he lets Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong take a ride in his airplane totally for free through his business, Funky's Flights. He even gives you a little piece of advice on where to pick up some extra lives. Other than admitting that he's a little bit in love with Candy, we don't really learn all that much about him in the game itself. And as far as I know, offering Candy some surfing lessons or a ride on his wave is definitely better game than some of the other attempts people have made to win over her affections. Happy birthday. Banana cream, your favorite. <sighs> Rejected. Another thing to mention here is that in the re-releases for Donkey Kong Country, Funky actually runs a fishing minigame, which to me further establishes two key aspects of his personality, his business acumen and his regard for the nature of DK Isle. Yeah, Funky starts a lot of businesses in these games, so you know, he's not a stereotypically lazy surfer stoner type. 
Funky isn't just a schemer and a dreamer, he gets things done, even if his outward appearance wouldn't make you think so. But like I said, he's not just a businessman, he's more in touch with DK Isle itself than some of the other Kongs. And if you think I'm pulling this environmentally conscious characterization out of my ass, check out this description of Funky Kong from the actual Rare website back in the day. The self-proclaimed coolest of the Kongs, a title he'll go well out of his way to uphold if necessary. Funky keeps himself up to date on what's happening around DKC, and is probably the one single member of the family who's seen most of it, what with his barrel flights outfit, boat building business, and endless quest for the best beaches to surf. And seeing as he's always on hand to help the more daredevil members of his family get from place to place during the adventures he personally takes great care to avoid, they can easily forgive his obsession session with style and baffling jungle-wise lingo. Now, while I do think it's interesting that Funky Kong is called the self-proclaimed coolest Kong and someone who can be a little bit obsessed with style, Funky Kong is, according to Rare, the Kong who has seen most of DK Isle through a combination of his flights business and his desire to find good surfing spots. Sometimes Funky has you fish bottles and trash out of the water, which I always thought was a cool addition to the fishing minigame premise. He's environmentally conscious, and he reminds us that there's more to battles against King K. Rule than just beating him up at the end of the game. I think we can fill in some of the blanks and assume he has a real connection to this place. Not that the other Kongs don't, but sometimes Donkey Kong is a little slow to take action, or needs to have his banana pile pilfered before he goes into hero mode. As I'll show you throughout this video, Funky Kong requires no inciting incident to snap into action. After the first game, he is almost always operating in the background, ready for any potential dangers to the island. Someone's gotta pick up the trash, and without Funky Kong's direction, what, do you think Donkey Kong's gonna do it? I mean, yeah, once you get him in the boat, he's not bad, but he's not gonna wake up and decide it's time to clean up the island. I mean, the dude's great in a fight, but he really only saves the day in one of the original three Donkey Kong Country games. I, for one, think it's kinda cool that Funky Kong has you fish the trash out of this beautiful island. What's the point of winning the war against King K. Rule if there's no fresh water to go back to? It's a surfer sentiment, for sure, but it's a worthwhile one in my book. Also, as far as the whole self-proclaimed and obsessed with style characterizations go, I think these are more fitting for Funky Kong's two early game appearances, when he's a little more carefree and fun-loving, but we will definitely see Funky Kong grow up throughout these games, more so than any other character. The other thing I want to point out about Funky before we move on to DKC2 is the original reference of his distaste for adventures. In the original Donkey Kong Country manual, the following is said of Funky Kong. Although Funky hates to go on adventures himself, he's too laid back, he keeps up on the island scene and may have useful information at times. Now, the reason I'm giving you the exact quote here is because I respect Donkey Kong lore and its many oddities, and the last thing I want to do is give you an unbalanced thesis. I don't go looking for trouble, Funky Kong says in the Donkey Kong novel Rumble in the Jungle, and most of the time, it doesn't come looking for me. As far as the literature says, Funky Kong originally hated adventures because of his laid-back qualities. So it's not necessarily that he hates adventures outright, but possibly more so that they crush his vibe, kill his joy, and make the dank waves a little less wicked gnar. Dude, that was wicked gnar. And that's about what we can glean of Funky Kong in the original game. He's a businessman, a pilot, a surfer, an egalitarian, and even more than that, he's a genuinely good guy who's always ready to help his friends and protect the island he loves. He just doesn't want to go out and do any fighting, even if his theme song was probably originally intended to be in Killer Instinct. And even if Funky Kong isn't fighting in the first game, well, thanks to some retconning, Let's just say it doesn't take long for him to enter the ring. When it comes to Donkey Kong Country 2, I wouldn't say that Funky Kong necessarily changes in major ways at a first glance. He's definitely still a certified Himbo Kong, but we do begin to see some emotions in his character. Some small developments, like added texture in a banana smoothie. For starters, check out this line from the game's manual. For me, this is where the entire investigation began. After Donkey Kong has been Kong-napped by the Kremlings, the remaining Kongs discuss who's gonna lead the rescue mission. Count me out, dudes, said Funky quickly, backing away from the group. I hate adventures. 
Now, I'm not going to make any grand claims yet without surveying the available evidence, but in my opinion, Funky Kong isn't solely avoiding adventures just because he's laid back anymore. There's a little something extra here, something between the lines, because I've looked into the heart of DK Isle. I've seen the ethereal form of Fedora Kong descending from the top of the mountain. I've looked, looked into, the, into eye the eye of this island, island and what I saw. was beautiful. Okay, all I'm saying is that the winds of change begin to blow in Donkey Kong Country 2, and I have a few ideas why, and it all starts with these little banana coins. See, Funky Kong's role is largely the same in this game as in the first game. He operates Funky's flights too, and can now just float in midair on his surfboard. Knowing Funky Kong, he has probably accomplished this feat either through intense transcendental meditation, freeing himself from the natural confines of reality, or maybe he's just strapped a motor onto it, I don't know. I mean, this whole area is just one big floating surfboard, so I don't even know where we are in space and time compared to Funky's more grounded base in the original game. All I can say for sure is that Funky's moving up in the world, literally. Now, the big difference with Funky this time around is that it costs two banana coins to fly his plane. This is a small change, but not an insignificant one, and I'm going to explicate it in a couple ways. First off, if we look at the history of Rare, we might say that perhaps they had already been bitten by the collectible bug even back in 1995, and the addition of banana coins and some of DKC2's other new collectibles were only the beginning of what would lead eventually to the collectathon behemoth that would become Don. Donkey Kong 64. So the boring way to answer this question is just that. Rare added banana coins to add a resource to the game, and they wanted all of their cast of characters to be tied into this resource to give it a function. From Funky Kong to Swanky Kong to even old Wrinkly Kong, everyone wants your banana coins. But that doesn't answer the question. Why would Funky Kong start charging for these flights according to the lore? Whatever happened to the laid-back monkey who just wants to help out his daredevil fellows? Well, I don't think you need to be a game theorist to figure this one out. Just look where we are in this game. This isn't DK Isle anymore. This is King K. Rules Turf. Crocodile Isle. There's roller coasters with skeleton heads and pirate ghosts and just honestly some really fucked up levels in this game. This place is insane. Diddy Kong and Dixie Kong have some serious guts coming here and as a matter of fact so do Funky Kong and all the rest of the Kongs. So if you ask me, the price for the flights is obvious. Flying on King K. Rule's Island is more dangerous than flying on DK Isle and for a dude who hates adventures, this is the last place Funky Kong would want to be. For as much as he loves his family, the two coins makes it worth his while to be here. Let's not forget, we're looking at a mogul. He still wants to help his friends, but come on, the dude's gotta make a living, and Wrinkly Kong charges too. This isn't DK Isle anymore, where you can fly around in friendly airspace for hours, shooting off nuts into the ocean. This is enemy territory. There are pirate ships with cannonballs. A lot of things fly and materialize out of midair, and even King K. Rule has a gun in this game. This is no joke, and no safe place for a pilot. And this is where I need to emphasize that just because Funky Kong is a support character who hates adventures and doesn't fight, it doesn't mean that he's a coward. He wants to help out, and he does help out, he just also wants a little something to show for it when he gets home. If you ask me, Donkey Kong Country 2 is where we see that Funky Kong recognizes pretty early on, perhaps even before the other Kongs, that the war between the Kongs and the Kremlings is getting pretty real. Actually, in the Game Boy Advance version of the game, in the 102% ending, Funky straight up drops a bomb on King K. Rool's getaway raft to try to bury this conflict as deeply as he can. And in this version, Funky is already working on the gyrocopter, which didn't show up until the third game in the original releases, but which Funky Kong uses to rescue everyone in the remake. Yeah, Funky Kong was always a tinkerer to some extent. He rented out boats, he rigged up his plane. I mean, it's not out of the ordinary for him to make something like a gyrocopter, but a bomb? Yeah, Funky Kong hates adventures, but I think DKC2 shows us that he also hates conflict and he actually wants it to end. I mean, I love the DK crew as much as the next guy, okay, but it's no secret that basically every time they fight King K. Rule, they think they have him beat, and then he just gets back up and keeps fighting. Funky Kong doesn't want to take half measures. Funky Kong wants to end this shit. And yeah, let's just reiterate, okay? It's a bomb. 
Funky Kong made this like a scientist or something in World War II, all right? And he just drops it, like without telling anybody. Hey, does anyone still want to say that Funky Kong only avoids adventures because he's laid back? I uh, invite you now to uh, make that point. And speaking of the gyrocopter, the GBA remake adds missions that Funky sends Diddy and Dixie on to improve their skills with the vehicle. On the surface, you might think these missions are a little more than what they seem. Added content involving Diddy and Dixie accomplishing very tasks like training with the vehicle, performing construction, rescuing captured Kongs, or even retrieving treasure, which perhaps Funky adds to his growing wealth. But I think there's more than what meets the eye here. For one, these Funky missions really expand the conflict of the second game. It appears that not only was Donkey Kong kidnapped, but other young Kongs have been captured as well, which really elevates the stakes of the Crocodile Isle showdown across the board. It implies a larger assault than just the beach attack that took Donkey Donkey Kong. It also implies multiple fronts of battle. The main attack, where Diddy and Dixie proceed from level to level and get to King K. Rule, and a secondary front, where Funky Kong coordinates rescue missions. And secondly, let's not ignore what this vehicle is capable of, and why exactly Funky Kong might be making sure that Diddy and Dixie know how to pilot it. The gyrocopter is integral at turning the tides of battle in both DKC2 and DKC3. We know that Funky Kong is a great pilot, so why would he have Diddy and Dixie do all these missions for him? Is it just that they're a little too close to adventuring for Funky's tastes? I think Funky is making sure that someone other than himself can actually pilot this thing, should the need ever arise. Or should Funky himself not be around to do it? The gyrocopter is basically his mechanical opus, as we'll see in the next game. And again, from Funky Kong's perspective, no one is safe anymore. Like I said, and like we'll revisit throughout this video, Donkey Kong's kidnapping is such a significant moment for Funky Kong. It snaps him into action and changes his motivation basically forever. I don't think it's it's unreasonable to believe that Funky Kong and Donkey Kong have known each other for a long time, and probably even grew up together. Funky Kong knows that it isn't some everyday occurrence that the big guy gets tossed into a cage. So if Funky gets kidnapped, he needs to make sure that this most important vehicle can still be used by someone, at least, to fight back. I also feel the need to emphasize the importance of these rescue missions. I don't know whose idea this was to add these into the game, but like, you really gotta think, this is the only Donkey Kong game where there are a significant amount of other Kongs just straight up captured by King K. Rule. Yeah, rescuing Donkey Kong is obviously important, even though he won't act as a playable character for still another game or so, but it's Funky Kong who makes sure that no one gets left behind. While Swanky is running game shows and Cranky is being cranky, Funky Kong is coordinating missions that are saving people's lives. And these aren't like grown-up Kongs either. They're all modeled after Tiny Kong, which makes me think that these are children. Just like I said in the last game, where cleaning up pollution has its own importance, in addition to just defeating King K. Rule, what's the point of rescuing Donkey Kong if we leave all these other innocent monkeys behind? And not just innocent monkeys, but innocent kids. Funky was already awesome, but comparing his roles in the first and second games presents quite the glow up. It's also no wonder he abandons his more carefree look after this game. He's been overseeing special ops and flying over haunted hills. This dude wants to be stationary for a little while, but more on that later. So that's where Donkey Kong Country 2 lands us with Funky Kong. He's more aware of the escalating dangers in the various wars with King K. Rule, going so far as to charge for services he used to offer for free, and as the GBA remake shows us, he's definitely not afraid to get involved. You could consider this a slight retcon of Funky Kong's development, as we'll see later. If you look at the original timeline, it's kind of crazy how much Funky Kong changes in Donkey Kong 64, but Nintendo or someone decided to go back and add this little inkling that Funky Kong was already making weapons even back in DKC2. And I do think it makes sense. I mean, we also see his skills as a mechanic improve drastically in this game, but note that he's not just fixing up fishing boats anymore. After the events of the first game, most of Funky's efforts that we actually get to see are in direct aid of fighting back against King K. Rule. He's a monkey with a motive now, not just some productive beach bum. And if his floating surfboard isn't a result of monkey 
meditation, then I'd say Funky Kong is starting to develop some pretty complex shit. Before we move on, I want to emphasize that I also think Funky Kong takes these cautious approaches to business because he actually understands the danger of what's going on. He doesn't want to get captured like Donkey Kong did. He doesn't want to assume a battle is over just because it looks like someone is down for the count. Basically, Funky Kong does not want to become a liability just because he's on the sidelines. But just as Donkey Kong Country 2 pushed Funky Kong a bit out of his shell, the swan song of the Super Nintendo trilogy takes him into, arguably, the most important role he'll ever fill throughout the entire series, at least up to the point where he became playable. And even then, I think you could argue that Donkey Kong Country 3 is perhaps Funky Kong's greatest moment. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. We're already through the first two games in the Donkey Kong universe, and not too much has changed about Funky Kong. He still dresses the same, he's still flying planes, the whole bomb drop thing was pretty intense, but where is this going? Where is the development? Well, it's in Donkey Kong Country 3 where I think the puzzle pieces finally start coming together. Heil from DK Vine considers this the era where Funky Kong started to grow up, and I believe it is in this game where we can solidly draw conclusions about the effect that the war with King K. Rule has had on Funky Kong. It's easy to see right from the get-go that this isn't the same Funky as before. I mean, even if you just consider his new theme in comparison to his previous themes in the last two games. Funky's theme in DKC3 is much more understated. It's cool, but it's calm. Funky Kong has leveled out and leveled up a bit in this game, and his work itself is more serious. In DKC3, Funky Kong is no longer a surfer and pilot, but a fully dedicated mechanic renting out vehicles to Dixie Kong and the newest protagonist, Kitty Kong. Notably, Funky Kong does not have locations around the world this time, but instead he resides in just one single location, a dedicated base of operations. Logistically, this makes sense. It would be impractical for Funky to have garages all around the Kremisphere, because he'd have to be transporting heavy machinery all the time, and Funky Kong does more mechanical work in this game than he has in any previous DKC game. Look, those barrel planes ain't no aircraft carriers, okay? Even if they do haul Donkey Kong's beautiful, bodacious behind all around DK Isle. And for someone who doesn't like adventures, this new situation works out quite nicely. By the third game in the series, Funky is as far from the action as he's ever been. He even passes off Kitty Kong, who we can maybe assume he has been left and trusted with by the child's parents, to Dixie Kong. And he's just kind of like, yeah, you'll make a great pair. Go on an adventure, I don't know. Kitty Kong can throw you in the air, you can throw him, it's fine. Here's five banana coins, go see a Star Wars. In this game, you bring Funky Kong's spare parts found around the world so that he can use them to fix up new vehicles. But given the nature of these items, like a pair of skis or a simple patch, we can really see Funky Kong's mechanical abilities on full display here. I mean, the airplane and the atom bomb were always impressive, but in this game, Funky Kong is like, oh, you're giving me a wooden plank and some bubble gum? One second, I got you. <laughs> This dude can turn anything into anything, it's crazy. You could even argue that some of the vehicles they use in Diddy Kong Racing were actually invented by Funky Kong. He's basically the sole creator of this hovercraft we see recur throughout the extended Rare universe. Also, if you collect every hero coin in the game, Funky Kong gives you his completed gyrocopter, letting you save the last of the banana birds and banishing King K. Rule for at least a couple years. Once again, we see Funky taking more direct action by significantly significantly contributing to kicking the king of the Kremlings out of the picture, and he's as dedicated as ever to his craft. With the bomb dropping in DKC2, to the vehicle building and lending, and banana bird gathering in DKC3, to the fact that Funky Kong is the most consistently useful side character across all three games, you could argue that Funky Kong is the single most important entity for the Kong family in actually turning the tides of this war. He's clearly a step above the other side characters. He's more than just a resource. Maybe he hates adventures, but he is committed in this game. You can tell by the way he tosses his wrench in the air like a fucking badass. 
So what inspired this change in Funky Kong? Why go from surfer to full-time mechanic? The previous game manual saw him quickly backing away at the mere mention of an adventure, and even though he still isn't on the front lines, he's doing more than he ever has. So what's going on behind those shades? Well, from a development standpoint, Rare was never committed to any particular character filling the same particular role in every single game. As opposed to Nintendo, who tries to maintain consistent branding and design for their main casts, Rare was always changing up the formula back in the day. The whole reason Dixie Kong showed up in the second game as one of the new protagonists is because they thought it would be exciting to try something new in the series. And I don't know, maybe Uncle Kong was busy or something, I'm not sure. I'll have to give that guy a call, it's been a while. Anyway, with both Diddy Kong and Donkey Kong captured in DKC3, we once again have an altered protagonist pairing, which puts Dixie Kong in the lead this time. So if you ask me for a real world answer, I think Rare simply was never afraid to put their characters into new roles to make things seem less formulaic. I also think as a studio, they legitimately enjoyed letting their creations, from major characters to minor characters, evolve and take on different forms just for the hell of it. I think Rare couldn't help themselves sometimes. It just made sense for their worlds and their characters to evolve. But what about a non-real world answer? What can we learn from the lore itself? Well, there are a few directions I think we can go with this. For starters, as we know, Funky was already operating and maintaining planes, boats, and bombs, so the jump to being a full-time mechanic isn't a huge stretch by any means. You've also got to remember that he made out with quite a lot of pirate gold after DKC2. Maybe he invested his banana coins into some better gear and a better garage, allowing him to, instead of operating vehicles and running small business schemes, create more specific vehicles for the other Kongs. And like I said, though Funky Kong has never been more detached from the main action proximity-wise, he is without a doubt a more major character in DKC3 than either Donkey Kong or Diddy Kong. His vehicles are integral, are required to progress in the game. DK and Diddy are just waiting to be rescued while having their minds flayed to pieces by chaos. Funky Kong is actually an active participant in the story this time around. And by the way, the story of this game is crazy. I'm not gonna get into it right now, I'm just gonna leave it at that. I'm not really gonna elaborate on this, but yeah, this game is kinda nuts, I'm not gonna lie. Anyway, I think we can even further justify Funky Kong's changes in this game when we consider Hyle's hypothesis that this is the game where Funky Kong starts to grow up. If the lack of bling isn't enough for you, I think Funky Kong's advancement in his abilities correlates perfectly with the conflicts of each game. I think the original assault of King K. Rule made Funky Kong realize that this beautiful island could be destroyed by an outside invader, leading him to preparing some real ways to fight back. Then, I think the kidnapping of Donkey Kong in Donkey Kong Country 2 and the combined kidnapping of Diddy Kong and Donkey Kong in Donkey Kong Country 3 only solidified both Funky's anti-adventure stance and the new, more involved resolve we see in both this game and the next game. If someone as tough as Donkey Kong is getting successfully targeted for two games in a row, and someone as nimble as Diddy Kong, who actually has more hero credits at this point, is also getting scooped up, then staying as far from the action as possible and being more prepared than ever is probably a good call. Funky Kong knows that the kids can handle the adventure, but he also knows that his own support needs to continue growing, bigger and better, if the Kongs really hope to win not just the individual battles level to level, but the war itself game to game. He's also cool with just tossing a baby into action, so is Funky Kong using child soldiers? I will leave that up to you. Another thing to point out for this game is that Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong are not exactly proactive protagonists. In the Donkey Kong Country 3 manual, Dixie Kong notes that these two pals have planned three times now to go exploring DK Isle, but every time they try, they end up going no farther than the beach. On their fourth attempt to explore, they end up kidnapped by King K. Rule, sparking the events of this game. I gotta say, I kinda love the lore detail that Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong are just straight up like bros. Like, they have all these big plans to go on these big hikes and like do all these great things, but it's just like, eh, we're at the beach, man. Let's just kick back. You know, we've been working so hard, you know, like, let's just, let, let's just take it easy. 
easy for the day. I think in Donkey Kong Country 3, and even more so in Donkey Kong 64, we see Funky Kong realize that it's just never gonna be Donkey Kong or Diddy Kong, or really any of the main Kongs who will actively prepare for these conflicts. Somebody has to do it, and Funky Kong knows now, without a doubt, three games in, that that someone is him. He also knows that his previous efforts haven't been enough, so he takes things up a notch. Am I positing that Funky Kong is the true hero of the Donkey Kong Country universe? Well, no. That would be ridiculous. But I am saying that the more I look at the facts, I don't think the Kong's eventual victory over King K. Rool in the mainline games would have happened without Funky Kong. I mean, the DK crew beat the snot out of so many Kremlings that King K. Rool actually had to employ robotic soldiers in the next game. But these creations are sort of exactly my point. For each victory the Kongs score, King K. Rool seemingly has yet another technological advancement up his sleeve. Which is where Funky Kong comes in. As King K. Rool's technological achievements advance, so do Funky Kong's. Let's also not ignore that the conflict of the previous game has clearly had some serious ramifications on Funky Kong's motives, planting seeds for the militaristic shift that we'll see in Donkey Kong 64. Because even though we don't have another large-scale situation where a lot of different Kongs are kidnapped, like we saw in DKC2, Funky Kong has apparently seen the value in coordinating those rescue missions. And he continues to train Dixie Kong and Kitty Kong in both real and simulated preparedness scenarios. In this game, with no real Kongs to liberate, Funky Kong has Dixie and Kitty Kong attack Kremlin boats in a mission called Destroy. He has them gather Kremlin mines in a mission called Disarm. He has them defend their fellow family members, or perhaps reconstructed dummies, in a mission called Protect. And finally, he has them compete against Kremlings in a mission called Race. I think these missions are a mixture of real war efforts, as in the disarm and destroy scenarios, and training exercises, as in the protect and race missions. The reason I say that protect is likely just a scenario is because you can also protect Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong, who shouldn't really be present right now because they're kidnapped, as well as Funky Kong himself, who should be coordinating the mission. So whether these missions are the real deal, or just more training, I think similarly to the retcons in DKC2, which positioned Funky Kong as a weapons manufacturer much sooner than the original series did, I think we're beginning to see the path toward Funky Kong's eventual psychological shift much more clearly because of DKC3's additions, showcasing his increasingly militaristic outlook and proclivities. What was, in the original timeline, an admittedly drastic shift is now at least telegraphed with a few significant events. But more on that later. Though if you do require any final evidence that Funky Kong is clearly very affected by the war with King K. Rule, look no farther than the Disarm minigame. It's pretty common in like real world wars for mines and other weapons to be left around and sometimes literally kill people long after the war is over. Funky Kong seems to be the only guy in the entire Kremisphere who's actually thinking about this type of stuff. No wonder he goes on to build bases all over the place in DK64. His world worldview is changing right before our very eyes. I also think it would behoove us to note Funky Kong's isolation. For now, anyway, this is no longer a mobile monkey. Funky Kong is on a new island with very few other inhabitants. I think this is important to remember as we look ahead to the coming game. By the way, Funky Kong is now back to not charging in this game. If you ask me, it's probably because of all the coins and treasure he came home with in DKC2. I mean, I'm not saying this dude is like filthy rich, but he's definitely financially free and had all the means to move way out here by himself. And given the shortened lifespan of the Kongs, he wants to make the most of his time. It's also possible he doesn't charge money anymore because he's seen the horrors of Crocodile Isle and no longer wants to attach a monetary value to accomplishing the greater good. It might just not be worth it for him to even be worrying about money at this point when King K. Rule is still out there. Like Wrinkly Kong and her Banana Bird vision quest, Funky is serving a higher purpose now. Anyway, to wrap 
wrap up discussion on this game, it must be said that Funky Kong is truly the embodiment of the growing arms race between the Kongs and the Kremlings. Any war effort needs someone making this stuff. The soldiers on a boat don't also build the boat. And for better or for worse, military invention does often drive technological progress. So the Kongs being at war for three games is bound to spur some new and exciting technologies from the main mechanics of both sides. Funky Kong starts off making boats, and by the end of the trilogy, he's making gyrocopters. He's making vehicles out of scrap metal. He's making crazy, innovative stuff out of anything that Dixie Kong and Kitty Kong can find. He knows that he has to keep up with King K. Rule, who, by the way, in this game, invents Chaos, a robot made from pots and pans who channels Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong's cerebral energy to function. I'm just gonna let that sentence sink in for a little bit. King K. Rule has basically invented an Evangelion, and in the next game, King K. Rule is on a mobile island while Funky Kong lives out of bunkers making weapons. Yeah, I guess it's about time we talk about this. In the next game, King K. Rule launches his most vicious, comprehensive assault yet, where the battle between these two forces elevates to an entirely new level, and we see Funky Kong in his most drastic role change yet. Donkey Kong 64 shows us a Funky Kong that no one saw coming. Gone is the surfboarding monkey with a laid-back attitude. Gone is the pilot, the beach dweller. Instead of a surf shack or a garage, in DK64, Funky Kong lives in a base fit for a doomsday prepper, complete with explosives and AM radio. This is Coast to Coast AM, and it's a hot time in the old town tonight. Things are a poppin'. It's honestly kind of crazy how much his character has changed in this game. His wide, staring eyes sit behind red sunglasses, and he's sporting his best Joker smile. As he speaks, he can't help but pantomime guns, explosions, and airplanes, perhaps relive his former operations on an endless loop. Funky is just as helpful as ever, don't get me wrong, supplying each Kong with their own gun and ammo, but to see this guy become this guy is a serious transformation. So what the heck happened? Well, I think there are a few branches, if you will, that we can investigate to piece together what remains of Funky Kong in Donkey Kong 64. If you ask me, Funky Kong finally snapped. And I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way. I think he had seen enough in the original Donkey Kong Country trilogy and decided to build some operational bases around DK Island in anticipation of the exact events of this game. An assault from King K. Rule that captures not one, not two, but four members of the DK crew with two would-be members absent and one supporting member dead. But the thing is, Funky Kong was preparing for this exact scenario, and it totally happened. It's as if he spent all his banana coins on some post-apocalyptic slop, and then two weeks later nuclear fallout actually happened. He was right on the money. Mm. Mm. It, oh, good. Oh my god. <clears throat> See, this is why I personally consider illusions between Funky Kong and your typical stoner conspiracy theorist. The weed smoker to gun nut pipeline is a lot shorter than people acknowledge. I mean, look, I know this is gonna be anecdotal conjecturing, but I've met a lot of Funky Kongs in my day. I worked in a food truck, okay? It was bound to happen. I've met some hippies who had a carpeted treehouse in their backyard. I've met a transient surfer bro philosophizing in his parents' basement and sustaining himself almost exclusively on Fritos. I've met some people who mounted surfboards on their RV and now tour the country living the van lifestyle. I also met some people who converted a school bus into a mobile home. Some of these people liked the occasional green banana, if you catch my drift. But I'll tell you something all of them did have in common. At one point or another, they explored an interest in the mechanical. At one point or another, they explored an interest in the psychedelic. At one point or another, they got into some weird conspiracies. Maybe took a few too many hits from the old grape shooter. And at one point or another, they got really weirdly into guns. Look, all I'm getting at here is that a lot of open-minded people who begin their journeys with, say, drugs or psychedelics, hoping to expand their mind and their worldview, 
actually end up staying in a garage all day and avoiding the world like some castaway Pinchonian primate, a smog of engine exhaust and bong fume hanging about their hovel, their browser open to some concerning web pages presenting whippet fueled alternate histories. What was that famous line? The one by Alan Kongsberg? I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness. Starving, hysterical, naked. See, a lot of people think he was talking about Jack Congerwack or William S. Barrels, but he was actually talking about Funky Kong throwing away his mechanic shtick to become a weapons dealer. Okay, we're getting a little far from the point here. I'm not saying Funky Kong smokes weed and fears the takeover of a new world order, okay? All I'm saying is I've seen plenty of hippies go from all around cool guy to weirdly isolationist and also a little too into firearms. I'm not trying to open a debate about the second an amendment, okay? I'm just writing about Donkey Kong. And for what it's worth, Hyla from DK Vine sees this more as Funky Kong's Q phase, as in the guy who produces weapons for James Bond. He's basically the technology producer for the DK crew. Though now that I think about it, the name Q is a little unfortunate. All I'm trying to say is that I won't blame you if you think this is too stark of a turn for Funky Kong's development. Real life illusions and crackpot theories aside, I actually think it makes sense for the character. As I've said, Funky Kong really cares about DK Isle and really cares about all his friends. And I think watching this King of the Kremlings come back three different times really changed his perspective on what it would take to defeat this army. And these are the facts. Without the coconut gun, which fires and spurts, that Funky Kong provides, you can't rescue Diddy Kong. Without Diddy Kong, you can't rescue Tiny Kong and Lanky Kong and Chunky Kong. Funky's contingency plan for a Kremlin assault actually just straight up perfectly worked. Donkey Kong was doing okay on his own with the help of Cranky and the ghost of his dead grandma, but it was really Funky Kong who got the ball rolling. Like I said before, from Rare's point of view, I think we're just seeing their enjoyment in bringing side characters to new places. They likely wanted there to be guns in the game and they thought it would be the right fit for Funky Kong to fill that role given his sidelining in the other games and his mechanical ability. I totally get that, but it's not so much that the role itself is intense. It makes sense for Funky Kong to develop firearms for the Kongs. It's more so the personality switch, the night and day difference of Funky Kong that makes this interesting for me. I mean, in addition to that reference in the Donkey Kong Country 2 manual, the whole reason I wanted to make this video is because of this transformation. Like, dude, Funky Kong is seriously intense in this game. To be fair, everyone's a little different in this game, and some time has definitely passed since the Country trilogy. Donkey Kong is actually participating in an adventure for the first time in like two whole games. Diddy Kong is apparently in the mood, whatever that means, and is definitely exacting some much needed revenge on the Kremlings. Kitty Kong has been taken by Child Protective Services, and even Cranky Kong is actually whipping up some potions this time around and doing more than just bullying you. He's got a mad scientist thing going on that works really well for the character. And Candy, of course, is back with her melons. Man, I know I kind of already said this, but this is why I really miss the rare era of Nintendo. I'm not saying this is character development on like a literary scale, okay? This isn't Welcome to the Monkey House by Kurt Vonnegong. I'm just saying it's so cool to see these characters do different things throughout these games, to change and operate under different roles. It feels like watching characters grow over the course of like a sitcom or something. Nothing major, like you wouldn't miss anything if you sat out a couple episodes, but there's some little stuff here and there. However, the most important thing for us to talk about in this game, the thing that we've been building to, even aside from Funky's new phase, is the end of the game. Because it's not Donkey Kong, Diddy Kong, Tiny Kong, Lanky Kong, or even Chunky Kong who delivers the final blow to King K. Rule. Instead, it is Funky Kong who walks into the room, aims his newest gun, which has been waiting in the wings for the entire game, and fires it at King K. Rule to score the winning blow. The game even opts for playing Funky Kong's theme song during this scene to hit home whose victory this really is. Sure, it was a combined effort that involved like 200 bananas and 10,000 side collectibles, and yes, it was technically Candy who distracted King K. Rule, which allowed Funky to take the shot. I'm not trying to perform Candy. Candy Kong erasure here by any means. But again, I want you to think about the big picture here. 
Funky Kong's doomsday prepping was involved and integral to the quest from beginning to end. This dude was just ready to kick ass, and the moment the opportunity arrived, he was there. You know, Funky Kong might look a little rough around the edges in DK64, but I think the victory of King K. Rule was a sort of release for him, and Funky Kong quickly converts his weapon into equipment for like a dance party, so maybe the real Funky Kong was still in there all along. He just had to trade that persona for another to get really serious about this war effort. After this, King K. Rule is never the villain in a mainline Donkey Kong platformer ever again. I mean, he shows up in some side games and the plotline of Donkey Kong Jungle Climber is... Oi, oi. Honestly, I don't even want to go there right now. All I'm saying is that things changed for the Kongs after this, and over the coming years, we'd see Funky Kong settle back into a form of his older self. He would never revert entirely to his surfer hippie getup, but he would find a nice middle ground. In fact, I'd say that more than victory, Funky Kong found freedom, which brings us to the present day. <laughs> Even though Funky Kong reclaims his identity, it's after this game where we enter a weird phase for the Donkey Kong universe, and as a result, Funky Kong too. You've probably heard this story in some way or another, but Microsoft bought Rare in the early 2000s, meaning that while its characters like Dixie Kong and Funky Kong and even Diddy Kong still belonged to Nintendo, I don't think it's off base to say that a definitive personality left the series along with Rare. See. After Donkey Kong 64, the series was largely relegated to two areas, spin-offs and Mario spin-offs. Racing, more racing, sports, racing. It seemed like these characters would never see a mainline game ever again. It seemed like these characters might not see any meaningful development at all. And Funky Kong was well loved in Mario Kart, and for as great as it was to use these characters and see them incorporated even more into the larger Nintendo family, it was hard to shake the feeling that the DK crew was DK through. But in a way, I think these lost years for the franchise actually tell us a lot about Funky Kong. Though the main series was on hold, our favorite himbo still had a story to tell. You gotta remember that timeline-wise, Funky Kong had just recently come out of the most intense personality shift of his life. He entered the ring that day as one monkey, and he left as another, and in time, a truer version of himself began to take shape. DK Vine hypothesizes that his bandana, sunglasses, and surfboard are just like he was in the early days, but his tank top and jorts are kind of like his more mechanical phase. So no, he's not the same monkey, but he's still funky. And instead of preparing for war, Funky Kong plays baseball. Instead of piloting gyrocopters, Funky drove to the top of his class in Mario Kart, becoming not only one of the best racers in the game, but also a beloved character outside of the game in both casual and competitive communities. He's been piloting planes for years as part of his various businesses, but finally he gets to do it for fun. His trophy in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, which came out in 2008 during the Donkey Kong drought, actually alludes to this change in Funky Kong by saying he may be tiring of business deals. And even though Funky Kong has sadly not yet appeared in Mario Kart 8, DK Vine also wonders if Funky himself wasn't the inventor of the Kong-themed carts. This theory also makes sense to me. Funky was never meant to create solely for the military-industrial complex, and this wouldn't be the first time we've had evidence of his creations showing up outside mainline games. I'm just going to interject here that when I first made this video, Funky Kong had not yet been announced for Mario Kart 8, but as of the Nintendo Direct on September 14th, Funky Kong has been finally announced for Mario Kart 8, so... This is a beautiful day for Funky Kong fans, a perfect time for this video to come out. I'm so happy for you, Funky. We've all been waiting for this moment. So if you own Mario Kart 8, please go play as Funky Kong today and take him on his next adventure. So yeah, while the series itself was stuck, Funky Kong was thriving. I mean, listen to how happy he sounds in Barrel Blast. Okay, on second thought, maybe there's actually some pain hidden behind that voice, but you see what I'm getting at here. Funky Kong is letting loose, shaking off his fatigues and his tool belt, and even engaging in some friendly rivalries with his past enemies. 
this is what you call recreational rehabilitation, my friends. And in a way, Funky Kong has come full circle, but the circle is a spiral, and instead of just reverting back to his old, chill surfer self hanging around on DK Isle, he spends a few years tagging along with Donkey Kong, seeing the world, and winning the hearts of many. In these intermittent years, not only does Funky Kong experience plenty of new things, but we get to see a new interpretation of his character. He's loud and wild, like this dude is just screaming sometimes. Oh yay! <laughs> So, what with a baseball career, racing career, and even appearing to help out in some of the spin-offs, Funky's story eventually does get hit with a gap year of sorts. Because even when there was a mainline Donkey Kong game, finally, Funky Kong wasn't even in it. The dude who was in the original Donkey Kong Country doesn't even show up in a game called Donkey Kong Country Returns outside of an offhanded reference from Cranky. And to be honest, I can't say for sure why Funky Kong wasn't in this game. I mean, he doesn't even have a cameo. For a real world answer, maybe we could posit that Retro Studios really wanted to take the series back to its simplest roots and focus only on what mattered, only the most recognizable characters, Donkey Kong, Diddy Kong, and Cranky Kong. But if this were true, it's strange that they wouldn't include Funky Kong, who alongside Cranky, appeared in every single original Donkey Kong Country game, and arguably had a larger role than any of the other side characters by the end of the original trilogy, and certainly by the end of DK64. And also, I would put Funky Kong right up there in the Hall of Fame of Donkey Kong iconography. Everybody loves Funky Kong, and while you could say that plenty of this video is already bordering on headcanon, I really do try to let the lore lead my conjecturing when I can, so there's not much I can offer for interpretation here, there's not much I can give for why Funky Kong is absent. Possible that Funky, after tagging along with Donkey Kong for the better half of the last decade, retreated back to his garage to spend some time by himself, or spend the last of his doubloons on a big vacation. It's also possible that at the site of a new adventure, he hightailed it out of there to let Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong handle it themselves this time, maybe to make sure that they could. It's possible that this is when he was working on the Donkey Kong theme cart and cart pieces for Mario Kart 8 and Mario Kart World Tour, and it's also possible that he ran out of money and started cooking up his next business scheme just in time for the sequel. Because even though he was nowhere to be found in this game, Funky Kong did eventually return. Tropical Freeze came around and Funky Kong was in it, but only a couple people played it because it was on the Wii U. And then Tropical Freeze came out again, and this time Funky Kong was playable. And it was a whole Funky Kong mode, with a surfboard and cutscenes and, uh, infinite spinning, which is a good trick. I'll try spinning, that's a good trick! One thing I find pretty funny, which Heil from DK Vine pointed out to me, is how Funky Kong is replaced by the animal buddy, Tox, while he's out being a hero. You know, while he's out spinning around. The DK crew has a long, storied history with their animal friends, but as usual, Funky Kong seems to have taken things up a notch. Tox mimics Funky's mannerisms and way of speaking, and is, of course, decked out in shades and up to his beak in jungle-wise lingo. As Heil sees it, Funky Kong must have adopted this little guy and trained him to be his very own mini-me, which is a more significant relationship than we've seen in most of the other animal buddies, aside from maybe Squawks, who seems to come and go and communicate with the Kong family. Funky Kong's friendship with Tox kind of harkens back once again to his deeper connection with DK Isle itself. Yeah, maybe Rambi helps out from time to time, but Funky Kong and Tox are business partners. It's not often we see Funky Kong run any of his business schemes with an actual business partner. He usually flies solo. It's also possible that Tox was already like this, and maybe him and Funky Kong met at like a Jimmy Buffett concert or something and became best friends. So Funky Kong comes home with a pretty sweet friendship, a business partner, and someone to watch over things for him when he goes off to be a hero. But wait a second, whatever happened to Funky Kong hating adventures? Even his bio in Mario Kart Wii, which came out during the drought of Donkey Kong games, reinforces the old idea of his distaste for them. So what happened here? Why the change? Well, really everything we've talked about up to this point has led to this exact moment of development. This video 
is the why. His increasing dedication to the war effort throughout the first three games, into the personality switch, and the switch back. The journey of a surfer to a soldier, and back again. Remember when I said Funky Kong has Bilbo energy? Well, when Bilbo returns home, he's glad to be back in the Shire, but he and his relationship to his home are forever changed. This is what Funky Kong's journey has led to. A monkey who, for the first time ever, actually wants to go on an adventure, because he's been over the mountains. He's driven along the ocean shore. He's won battles, won wars. He's managed to let go of a part of himself that he never thought he could. Okay, before you angrily type out a comment below, I'm not saying Nintendo actually thought of this stuff, okay? You'll never catch me giving Doug Bowser credit for anything. All I'm saying is that hidden within the beautiful tapestry of Donkey Kong games, there is another pattern that emerges if you look at it in the right way. And it's pretty funky. Look, you can disagree with the particulars of my theory all you want, but just look at his design in each game, side by side. This dude needed to get back to what made him funky in the first place. There is nothing funky about this guy, except for maybe the red sunglasses. So, given everything he went through, I think that when an adventure did finally come around again, Funky probably thought it wouldn't be so bad. Maybe it would even be fun. Couldn't it be worse than whatever this Dark Knight of the Soul was? The great thing about Funky Kong is, despite everything we know about him, I can't say for sure why he chose to tag along and freeze. Maybe it's a little bit of bravery. Maybe Funky Kong has lived a lot of life and wants to live some more. Maybe the death of Wrinkly Kong reminded him that life is short. Maybe witnessing and surviving the mortal terrors of Mario spin-off games made Funky realize he's a little more indestructible than he initially thought. A little adventure doesn't seem so bad after that. All I do know is that when Funky Kong finally does decide to go on an adventure, he does it in the exact way he would go on an adventure. He doesn't run out of his house basically naked like Donkey Kong. He brings his equipment, he's totally prepared. He can't be damaged on the spikes, he has the most health out of any character. He can't run out of breath underwater. Funky Kong's on an adventure, but he's also got his mithril, his lembus bread, and his trusty sword from the very beginning. He may not sell guns anymore, as far as we know, but this dude is a tank. Funky Kong basically pulled a Rocky at the end of Rocky IV and told us, During this fight, I've seen a lot of changing. But if I can change, and you can change, everybody can change! And that's where we leave Funky Kong in Tropical Freeze. Sure, maybe he went to a dark place. Maybe he saw some desperate times. Maybe he has some war flashbacks that we don't even understand the full extent of. But Funky Kong chooses to finally break the mold, face his fears, and tag along on an adventure. And as a surprise to no one, he's great at it. I think we should all remember this as we face our own fears. We never know what's truly inside. Because when I think of Funky Kong, and all that he's gone through, and that simple surfer we met all the way back in 1994, I wonder if maybe that surfboard defending him from the spikes isn't a means of protection, but a zen connection. I wonder if Funky Kong excels at adventuring something he hates, not out of skill, but by doing it in a way that he loves, in a way that is special and unique to him. That's what gives him his armor, not a gun, not any machinery, but his heart. Funky Kong is a reminder that when we act out of goodness and a desire to help others, even if sometimes it takes us to dark places, that is where we can derive meaning and excitement out of life. Maybe the ability to float on a surfboard, the knack for hitting the sickest flip on a motorbike while even leaving Super Mario in the dust on the racetrack. Maybe all of this is just what Funky Kong loves to do and it grows from his beautiful soul within from listening to his heart, reminding us all that all of our own individual potentials are deeper, realer, and more infinitely surprising than we'll ever know.